Welcome back to the dopest show you won't get sick of. I'm Spencer. This is Sasha. I spent most of my 20s in federal prison, but I've been off heroin since April 9, 2010. You know a little bit about addiction. You know a lot about getting in trouble. Hopefully these stories can get you back on the right track if you're on the wrong track. But, God forbid, you do end up in prison. Keep from making some of the same mistakes I made. Anyway, today's story is going to center around the day before I got sentenced to federal prison. So, most people, when they're out on bond, you know, they might be in house arrest, this, that, whatever, which I was on house arrest for a good bit, uh, for probably about 90 days. They required me to take a drug test every single day of the week. I had to take two drug tests in one day, an hour apart, one at the state building, one at the federal building. That's how ridiculous the system is sometimes. Three days a week, I was having to take two drug tests a day. <laughs> 30 minutes apart, chugging a drink in between, so then I'd have to go again. But anyway, this is the day before. So, I did not wallow in self-pity. I got up, I went to college, I w uh, took sociology and corrections class that particular day, and after that, we went to my lawyer's office to get a brief rundown of, you know, what was up. And I remember just asking him, dude, give me like an estimate. What do you think I'm going to get? How much time do you think I'm going to get? I can handle it. Tell me. I don't care if it what would lay the news on me. And he says, I really don't know. It could be really good. It could be really bad. But typically what happens is I ask for something, the prosecution asks for something, and the judge meets somewhere in the middle. Well, my lawyer is asking for it basically to be thrown out. If you haven't watched, I've got other videos about why I went to prison. But basically, you know, um, he his stance on it was... <laughs> It, the deal happened in my apartment. Yeah, it sucks that everything happened, but you know, it didn't profit off it, didn't arrange it, didn't know it was going to happen until it happened. So I, I get nothing from him. And I stress, I'm like, just I wish I knew. My mom, other family, they're in denial. They're like, but literally, you didn't do anything, so you, they're probably going to throw it out, or you might get a few months. And I'm like, no, definitely not. I'm being charged federally. I'm going to go to prison. It's a matter of how much time. I would like it to be less time, just like anybody would, but there's a very good likelihood I'm going away for a while. So, ultimately, you know, uh, after I left his place, I went and I trained karate for four hours. Something I did every day that I was out on bond, that it was open, um, six days a week, uh, four hours a day. I did the class, even did a private lesson with him after class was over, and my aunt, who... I don't see as much. Uh, she lives in Cincinnati. She's a pharmacist. She's worked in rehabs, actually. She's also worked in pharmaceutical studies, a number of things. Um, she she picked me up, and she figured it would be a pretty good idea just to clear my head if we just took a drive. So we just drove around for about an hour and a half. Now, my aunt is kind of, you know, she's not any hoodoo, voodoo, weekend, none of that stuff. She's Catholic, okay? But she's kind of believes in signs and all this crazy stuff and she told me something about my grandma her mom saying that we'd know she was around if a random feather appeared and there was a couple weird instances personally for me there's been some weird instances with that you know think of it what you may a lot of times i'm just you know kind of skeptic about that type of thing well during this drive that we kept taking and she's big on signs and she kept saying look look keep your eyes open the world points your signs and just keep your eyes open I'm like, yeah, whatever. Well, she starts mentioning it. There's a car in front of us. It has three eights on it. And she's like, look, the three eights. She's like, but turn sideways, that could be an infinity symbol. I'm like, great. I'm going to get forever in prison. Infinity. She's like, no. Sometimes infinity can mean new beginnings. It can mean a lot of different things. So I didn't think much of it. Then we see it, an eight, just one eight on one random sign that didn't make sense. Then we see it here, we see it there, we keep seeing eight or even the sideways infinity symbol logo on different things. Like we kept saying, seeing it in different places to the point where I was like, that is kind of weird, you know, I'll give you that. That's that's kind of odd, you know, whatever, you know, I'm still skeptical about it, you know, like, you know, she's talking about it having alternate symbolism. Like she's not talking about the literal number eight, she's talking about the infinity symbol symbols and different meanings and stuff like that. So that's what we're going with. That's basically what I thought, you know, she was trying to say. But what ended up happening, um, I went to bed that night. I didn't have sleep issues back then. I have sleep issues today. I have to lay in bed for 10 to 11 hours. I go to bed early. I go to bed at like 9 o'clock. 
And it's like a job for me to get sleep. I lay down in bed till usually about 8 a.m. just to get anywhere between five to seven hours of sleep. I wake up a minimum of four times, up to eight times during the night with dreams that seem like they're real. If I'm doing good in jiu-jitsu, judo, then uh, I'm beating people up in my dreams. But if I do sucky in class, get beat up in sparring, I dream that I get beat up. Sometimes I dream that I get shanked and I can actually feel the steel enter in my gut and it's these terrible PTSD dreams. Speaking of PTSD, she's helped out a whole lot with that. But back then, I didn't have those dreams. You know, I hadn't seen a whole lot of the crazy stuff that I did see in prison. But uh, I slept like a full 10-hour night the night before sentencing. I slept all the way through, woke up well-rested, went to court early that morning. So the sentencing day, that's a story in itself. But ultimately, my lawyer asked when the judge, because the judge basically asked, well, how much time do you think he should get? My lawyer says, well, he's been out a year and a half. He's a role model. He's led community service projects. He's been uh, one of the top people in his drug court group. There literally were papers out about me doing work with uh, kids on a Saturday program. So, like, when kids get caught smoking, drinking, whatever in school, and aside from the being suspended for a few days, they're required to go to a Saturday program. The Saturday program was, you know, usually about four to six hours, and half that time, they split the parents and the kids up. The parents are required to go, too, in a separate room. They have different people speak to them at different times. They have a woman who's a counselor there who didn't know anything about anything. She's <sighs> clueless, annoying woman, too. There's a very good man named Vinny who, former, uh, you know, addict, buddy, couch, couch, go. That's my little monk dog. Had to feed him some peanut butter so I could do this. He whines. He goes, ah, ah, ah. And, you know, she's just coming out of heat. And even though Snip got him neutered, doesn't help. It's all here all day. I probably just triggered him just now, so I apologize for that noise. But anyway, back to it. Um, My lawyer said he's, oh, with Saturday Kids Program. I spoke to the adults, and I told them a lot of stuff. You know, just giving them realistic advice. But I spoke to the kids, too. And the first thing to get the kids' attention is I tell them, yeah, at 16, I was a smuggler for the biggest heroin dealer in the city. I said, it seemed great and all this. And I say, I'm not going to tell you stories about some big bubba going to try to get you in prison. You know, something like that, like the stories you heard. I want to tell you, when I was in jail, what happened is this. You're in a pod with one TV for 50 people. There's two showers for 50 people. You never have privacy. You never have privacy. If you're using the toilet, the guard I told them all the annoying things, all the nagging things, and about how, imagine the most annoying person you've met in your life. Imagine there were 10 of them in one room that you could never escape. I told them realistic stuff. I didn't try to, the scared straight stuff, like people tried to do that to me when I was a kid, and I just ignored it. But I told them, listen, it sucks. Imagine no computer access. Imagine the all because you know kids live on their phones today, and I tell them the stuff that really sets with them. They're like, "Oh God, that does sound like it sucks." And I let them know you're going to have to use the toilet in front of your roommate because you're locked down probably about seventy percent of the day. And a lot of them really set in with a few of them. While I was in prison, one of them helped my mom carry her groceries out the car, say that it helped change his life. A lot of them go back and do the same stuff. You're not going to fix the world, but if you can fix something, make something click with one person, it was all worth it. So I did those, and it was a big thing, and made the paper. So my lawyer brought all this up. He's like, he's done perfect. He's been out on bond. He's gotten a second chance. He's done it right. Prosecution says, well, we think he should get 15 years. Well, the judge thinks about it, and he talks for a minute, and ultimately, which I'll get into the, sen the sentencing here in another day, there's a lot that happened that day, uh, the judge said 0, 15, 8. He gave me 8 years, but he didn't say 8. In the federal system, they sentence you 2 months. He told me, you have 96 months in federal prison. Well, I'm pretty good with math. I, I couldn't compute anything. My blood pressure went so high that my ears popped, I felt my face get hot, and I'm like, okay, 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 basic math. 12 times 10, 120. It's less than 10 years. That's good. But 60 months is five years. It's more than five years. So that's bad. So then I finally calculated and figured out. The judge, uh, you know, came down and he actually was teary eyed when he talked to me. And he actually said the words, and, you know, a lot of people were present for this. 
can tell you this is what he said. He said that he did not want to have to sentence me to any time. But as a judge, he is expected to uphold certain things and that he had to. And he ordered me to go to Morgantown Camp. And he said, at Morgantown Camp, they let you attend the local college. Well, they did back 20 years before. Uh, he was 93 years old, I think. Um, and he thought I was going to Morgantown. The BOP decided I was going to Petersburg Low. And then, because I made a mistake there, I went to the medium with camp points. But afterwards, we went out to eat. Uh, and I talked to, you know, we went out to eat, you know, get a meal after getting some news. Like, oh, he, after he sentenced me, my lawyer told him he has not completed drug court. If he does not complete drug court, he has to be sentenced for his state charges because drug court is a conditionary program for first time offenders. And since I was a first time felon, drug court was optional. Now, I had to do a year before I did drug court. Most people just go right into drug court. Don't do a day in jail. I had to do about 13 months before. I, but my lawyer kept me in all that time so then I could get time served. He figured if I stay in there for a long time, they'd give me time served for that. I could get out on the program while I was on bond for the federal charges. So he said, the judge said, asked my lawyer, well, when is the drug court graduation? And they hadn't set it up. He didn't know. And we knew it was going to be in the next few months. He says, well, I'll give him five months to self-surrender. That'll let him finish the program so then the state charges will be handled. Because on drug court, you have to jump through a million hoops. Like, it is ridiculous. Three drug tests a week, which you have to stand in a 45-minute line waiting, a single-file line, to take a drug test in a room where they hand you a cup through a slot in the wall and a guy's watching you behind a two-way mirror. You have to go to three two-hour drug classes a week. You have to do 100 community uh, service hours. There are a ton of conditionary things in there. Uh, and it's But if you complete it, they dismiss your first time felony charge. This is a nationwide program. I actually believe it was started in Roanoke, if I'm not mistaken. I believe it was Judge Strickland. Uh, whose son had addiction issues. If I, I might, I don't quote, I'm not sure about that. I think that's what it was. But anyway, they gave me five months to self-surrender, so I didn't have to go to jail that day. I didn't have to go to prison that day. So we went out to eat, and my aunt said, you notice something funny? And I said, well, what's that? She said, how much time you got? And I was like, holy, you're a witch. She guessed for an hour and a half, she kept pointing out the number eight. And I was thinking, like, she's trying to say I mean it, but, like, and I maybe she thought that, but she just talked about observe the signs that are around you the whole hour and a half. Like, I, I, was, I didn't believe it. I thought, whatever. You know, I didn't believe it, stuff like that. And then she turned out the judge gave me eight years. How could she have known that? The lawyer couldn't tell me how much time I was going to get. He said, I'm going to try to get you nothing. I'm going to try to get the case thrown out because it's a janky case. You shouldn't have got charged. I actually, at my bond here, and the one judge said, why is he here? Never mind. Never mind. Don't, don't answer that question. Once he found out why I was being charged. Uh, but anyway, um, it was a really bizarre thing. It was really bizarre that she completely predicted. Oh, I have to click that off. Oh. How much time I would get. I mean, what are the chances that she would pretty much predict exactly how much time I would get? Uh, it still trips me out to this day. Uh, during the next five months, I did a lot of stuff. I attended a ton of jiu-jitsu and martial arts seminars. Enzo Gracie, I got to train with him. I got to train with uh, Matt Sarah. Now, this is a seminar, you know, just a couple days. It was at Radford University called the Karate College. Bill Superfoot Wallace, world champion kickboxer. Uh, Joe Lewis, who was called the Muhammad Ali of kickboxing. Not the brown bomber Joe Lewis. There's a white guy, Joe Lewis, uh, who was a kickboxer. Joe Lewis and Bill Wallace actually had an epic fight before. Mark Hatmaker, who's a submission wrestler. Uh, got to train with Paul Creighton. There was a number of guys at this uh, seminar that I got to train at. And it was a really, really interesting time and I made use of every moment that I had out before I went in. I did not sit around and get high. I didn't drink myself. I didn't pity myself. I prepared. And straight up, I had watched the Alabama turned out in prison videos and I worried somebody going to get me. And I was worried about Fleece Johnson. I was worried about all that stuff. So I trained like a fiend. And ultimately, that is what I do today. I train. And that's how I keep off heroin. 
it's how I keep from going back to the life. When you get off drugs, they tell you you have to get rid of all your old friends, but they don't tell you where to find any freaking new ones. Well, for me, where I found new friends was training. That's my only friends. I have eight contacts in my phone, which are all immediate family and my coaches. You know, Paulo Santana is like a big brother to me. Tarrant Monaire is like a second dad to me. You know, uh, my buddy Scott Sigmund, you know, I love I, I need to get back up there. It's been a minute, but, man, I look at him like family, too. Good people, man. Uh, but they're, they're my family. The people on the mats, they're my friends. They're my family. I don't, I don't party. I don't go out and club. I don't drink. I don't hang out. I don't even have people over ever. I'm a recluse. And you know what? I like it. But guess what? There's nobody from my past that could do anything at all to me. Like if in, out of my past, I've seen some of the people I used to hang out with. A couple people don't like me. They see me and they look and see, I've been, I power lifted in prison. I'm not that skinny little guy who was there before. What are they going to do to me? You know, I've trained two hours a day, twice a day for five years. So I wouldn't have to worry about anybody. And ironically, I haven't had to use it except for the one time when it was a random attack on me. Uh, but, you know, it's nice having that security because back when I was 135 pounds and I didn't know how to fight and I wasn't big, I remember thinking, well, I'm going to change this. And I did. I have changed it. And I'm really happy about that. If you've watched this far and you feel like I have earned a press of the like button, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you guys for watching. This is a little bit of a different video, but I had to mention it. Because it's a weird story, man. She, she talked about that number eight for an hour and a half. Then I got eight years. I, that's some weird stuff, man. That still trips me out. But anyway, y'all have a good one.